Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good day and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Leon Tabak, and as you see, I will be moderating the discussion today. Our topic is romance in the time of COVID during this pandemic. Our interest here is uh, the social challenges that young adults have. So we might not focus exclusively on romantic relationships, but rather the challenge of, uh, that face young adults who may be away from home for the first time at school or at work, trying to keep up with old friends, trying to make new friends, and possibly trying to find uh, a romantic partner as well. To help us in the discussion, we have, uh, we have two guests. Uh, Michaela Kelleher is a student at Cornell College. She's a junior. I uh, teach at Cornell College and had the privilege of, uh, of spending a term with Michaela at the very start of her, uh, her career here at Cornell College. Now, she presents an interesting case. She came to Cornell at a time when things looked pretty normal. And then a few months later, this pandemic arrived and she's had to adjust. And so basically the largest part of her college career has been during this pandemic and all of the adjustments and restrictions that have come with that. And also with us today is Kayla Fitzke, who is a professor at the University of Iowa. She's a family therapist. So she's teaching, she's studying, and she has a special area of interest in uh, young adults and how they adapt and grow and so on. So I'm hoping we're, we'll hear some interesting perspectives from her as well, both from her personal experience and her teaching and research uh, with young adults. So I've given you a little introduction. I'd like you to say a little bit more to help our audience tell us something about your background, your interest in this topic, whatever you'd like to say. So why don't we start with Kayla, Professor Kayla at the University of Iowa. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure thing. And thanks for having me. Um, as Leon mentioned, I'm a professor of couple and family therapy at the University of Iowa. So on a regular basis, I'm interacting with undergraduate students in a variety of different majors and graduate students who are studying couple and family therapy. And my research focuses on Kind of the fledgling adults, so we call them emerging adults. They're about ages 18 to 25, and really trying to find ways to promote their well-being, in particular looking at their relationships and how we can use those relationships to really help to promote things like positive mental health and um, positive physical health and just day-to-day -day interactions. Okay. And Michaela, tell us a little bit about yourself here. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, Leon. As Leon had mentioned, I'm a junior at Cornell College. My major is behavioral neuroscience. Um, I'm involved heavily around campus. I'm in student senate. I'm an RA. I'm the president of a bunch of clubs. So I'm heavily involved, and I see a lot of the impact that COVID has had around campus. OK. All right. So maybe a, maybe a first question here might be, um, you know, forever since the time began when people, when a man looked for a woman, a woman looked for a man, we would, we might look for a partner who shared a similar religious faith, a similar political outlook. We look for these kinds of compatibilities. And now we have to think about, does this person perceive risk in the same way as I do? Is this person willing to accept the same degree of risk during a time of illness as I do? So I'm very interested in what you've seen uh, among your friends, among those with whom you work, how they negotiate this. How would you begin to, I perceive big differences between people. There are some people who minimize the risk, in my opinion, and some people who I believe greatly exaggerate the risk. Some people who are very cautious, some people who are more nonchalant. How do you see people bridging this gap or finding a compatible person like this? Who wants to begin there? What have you seen among your friends? I can start, sure. 
Um, as I mentioned, I'm on Student Senate, and in that role, I'm the chair of organizations. So I'm in charge of all of the organizations around campus. And last year, we had a great impact on people's involvement, people wanting to hang out in terms of organizations, um, and just in friends in general. So I saw a great detriment um, just because people were taking it so seriously around campus that organizations started to go defunct, people weren't as active, and I think a lot of people missed the communication that they had with people in previous years. So I think that led to the biggest downfall for organizations on campus and just that interaction that people had together. Were students expressing disappointment then to you that they, they couldn't meet as they expected to be able to meet or that they were used to being able to meet in previous years? Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of miscommunication, people not knowing where to meet in the time of Zoom when that became a big thing for us here on campus. Um, students didn't like meeting on Zoom as organizations, so that definitely played a role in communication that people had and why some organizations aren't with us today. Yeah. Okay, Kayla, what would you say about this year? Negotiating the different perception of risks and so on. Yeah, I agree that I definitely see a gradient of um, reactions and perspectives of risk. I think from those who, you know, don't perceive a risk at all and to those who are very risk averse, depending on, you know, whatever context they have, maybe they're perhaps immunocompromised. And so they have to be risk averse and really anywhere in between. And um, I think a lot of those anecdotal experiences are also backed up by research too. at least some of the initial research that's come out. I have around a quarter of folks saying, you know, I don't really see COVID as a risk and I'm not doing things differently. And then um, a little bit of a smaller percentage of people who are being very risk averse. And then everyone who in the middle is really doing a calculation to say, um, you know, what level of risk am I comfortable with and, and what aspects am I okay with some of the, um, you know, the positives outweighing some of those risks and making decisions as a case by case basis. Now, we've done other programs here on Ethical Perspectives on the News about, about polarization in our society, political polarization. And there's a sense that not only do people have different points of view, but sometimes their judgment of others is very harsh. There's an unwillingness to say, well, different strokes for different folks, right? And I, I see some of that with this, this illness. It's not just that I'm going to walk a wide path around you because because I, I want to protect myself more. But then I kind of shrug and say, well, if you want to go that way, that's up to you. Um, rather, there's a judgment of people. Um, am I right or wrong there? What do you think? Is this, is this a kind of polarizing issue in the same way that, that electoral politics polarizes people? Yeah. Yeah, I think that unfortunately that the pandemic has been politicized, um, you know, for whatever reason that may be, but it certainly has been the case. And so when you're bringing people's emotions and feelings and perhaps their political beliefs into something like public health, it just creates a perfect storm for people to disagree and to become really defensive when someone brings up a viewpoint that's different than yours, which makes um, you know starting new relationships perhaps really difficult. Um, but on one hand of things, um, it really helps you to find people who are seeing things similar to you because people are a little Bit more upfront about what those belief systems are. Yeah. Have, have, uh, Kayla, uh, Michaela, have you uh, have you heard of anybody? Has anybody invented a a formal way of asking prospective friends where do you stand? Do, have people worked out a routine to negotiate this in any way that you've seen? Great question. So as an RA, I'm in the res halls all the time. And I yep. think one of the main ways is just visually gathering what information people want to share. So if a resident is quickly running down the hall to use the restroom, do they have a mask on? You can definitely tell what their level of comfortability is just by that alone. Um, so it's a lot of observation, I think, rather than right out asking somebody what their comfortability level is, but I don't see anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I don't want to put the two of you on the spot. So you tell us as much or as little about your personal lives as you like. Um, 
But I am interested uh, if you wish to share, if you've had experience with dating during this time, I'd like to know what you know about, about video dating, alternative formats for dating. I have read that uh, online dating services have seen an uptake in their, in their business during this time. So um, maybe different kinds of, of social engagements, maybe different ways of finding uh, prospective partners. What, what, what are you willing to share with us uh, today? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I've been married for five years, so my husband would probably be quite upset to find out that I've been using dating uh, websites. Um, so no personal experiences except from what students have shared about their personal experiences um, and what I have seen discussed, um, you know, on social media as well as in the research too. Um, there have been this uh, the dating websites have done a pretty good job of marketing some of the changes that have come out in terms of their usage. They have um, shown how the data, especially when the initial shutdown had happened in March of 2020, their rates of usage just skyrocketed. And we've seen a little bit of a decline in that, but those, um, especially the really popular dating apps, have stayed pretty heavily used. Um, I think the thing that perhaps we don't see quite as much as which groups are using those. And so I think some of the biggest increases weren't actually in the college student population, even though that's sometimes what the groups that are, that those are the groups that are being marketed. And so um, I think when we are looking at those college student groups, they're maybe increasing use of data, or excuse me, dating websites and apps, but maybe not as much as you might expect. Did, you, did your scholarship ever touch upon dating online dating, dating services? Is that ever a subject for your study? Not in my particular one, um, but I definitely read kind of a variety of things that are coming out. And there are some folks that are doing that more so in just survey usage of, you know, are you interested in using these data websites? Do you see them as being something that you would be interested in doing? I think one thing that um, we've seen with the change in the pandemic is some of the somewhat negative attitudes that might be associated with using a dating website that existed pre-pandemic have kind of gone away with the switch towards everyone moving towards remote means of communication and meeting people. And so that's one big switch that we've seen as well. Okay, so Michaela, people come to college and uh, oftentimes they have a boyfriend or girlfriend back home. And uh, so a transition for many young adults is, will that relationship last when they're apart, uh, hundreds of miles apart? How will they keep up that relationship? It was challenging enough before, now it's more challenging with travel having been more difficult and so on. And then of course, many students go to college and they find new romantic adventures at college. Uh, so well, what have you seen or what are you willing to share with us about, uh, about your own experience? Um, what you see in the, uh, the residence hall, whatever, okay. Yeah, I've been with my boyfriend for about two years and okay. we were actually fortunate enough to grow up in the same town, go to the same high school, do all the same activities. So when it comes to how we've navigated COVID and um, businesses being shut down or things like movie theaters not being open for us to go get entertainment, we've been pretty cooped up and decided to start video gaming together. Um, we have a lot of indoor movie nights. Um, we hang out in close quarters together um, just because that's what's been available. In terms of the res halls, I've definitely seen a bit of a spike in people just hanging out more in each other's rooms, um, whether or not that has affected anything um, outside of Cornell, I'm not sure. I'm sure people have found things to do off campus, um, but I tend to stay on the safe side and stay on campus and hang out with my friends that way um, and get to know everyone here on campus as I can. Well, so then you raise an interesting question there, Michaela. I was curious about uh, uh, couples on campus who get to a point where one wants to introduce the other to his family or her family. But if, if the two of you, if, if you and your friend are from the same hometown, then the family visit isn't such a big issue. Um, I wonder how other people negotiate that. I, I, now, Kayla, have you, is this, have you thought about this at all? Uh, how people would do this. You must have yeah. had a time when when you you brought your uh, your future husband home and introduced them to the folks and uh, 
he introduced you to his folks and right isn't that part of the ritual yeah and a terrifying one for most people at that <laughs> um yeah i'm sure for for some they might be um, a little excited about the option to deter or delay perhaps meeting um one's parents because of COVID using that as an excuse um but i think that people have figured out ways around this um and it also depends on what your perspective of risk is again right some families are not seeing it as a risk or maybe perhaps they see a little bit of risk but meeting you know, their child's significant other is important enough to them that they'll take some precautions and make sure that everyone's safe enough to meet. So they, you know, make some adjustments because it's important to them. So I think people are still being able to do this where it might become a little bit more challenging is if you're not within perhaps driving distance. And so that might require, you know, a trip across several states. We live in Iowa and all of our family lives in Virginia. So if we were dating, maybe it'd be a little bit harder to bring him home to meet the family. So I think people are really making, again, those just risk judgments about what's possible. Yeah, I thought about this. Uh, we went two years with uh, my wife and I are, are separated by more than a thousand miles from our mothers and uh, in two different directions, you know, so we can't, we can't visit both mothers at the same time. And so we went two years without seeing our parents and uh, then caught up this, this in this last six months. At Christmas time, I, I went to see my mother and then I got a cold at the end and it occurred to me, I could get stuck here. They might not let me back on the plane. So it's it's not just getting out there. This is my first time flying in several years. It's not just getting out there. It's how do I get home when if I, if I do get sick. Okay. So I'm going to reveal a little bit about myself and uh, at, at the risk of embarrassing myself and maybe my wife at home. Okay. So I, I am... I'm not very experienced in these matters at all. I'm sure it's obvious to my whole audience, right? I met my wife. I met one woman who was willing to take me and I, I, everything worked out. That's, <laughs> that's the whole story. But I had a little bit of, uh, you know, some friends in, in high school and college and uh, you, know, you meet, meet somebody at a summer camp or, or a summer trip and, and then you'd exchange notes when you came home and, uh, the girls in those days would, would send lovely notes on stationery and they put a little wax seal on it. It was perfumed and you get this little, well, you know. Does that happen anymore? Has anybody reinvented this in this day of email? Have people reinvented old forms of courtship that might, might be a plus for this whole experience? Definitely within friendship. Um, my best friend who was actually in your class too, um, our very first year here. Um, I She lives in Texas. So over the summer when we got sent home, we would send letters to each other. And sure, we had text message and Snapchat yeah. and all of that fun technology. But it was just, there was something so genuine about writing a letter and writing all these details in there that just made it so much more fun and so much mm -hmm. more enjoyable to get through the pandemic when we did get sent home. And she would send me letters back and it takes a few days because of the distance, sure. but it was still quite enjoyable to get mail and um, make our friendship work that way. It was fun. I think there's something special about seeing somebody's handwriting on paper mm -hmm. and knowing that what you're holding in your hand was in the other person's hand a few days ago. It makes it feel more real. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Kayla? I think the sentimentality is um, a really unique aspect of that. And just the intention, right, that someone took the time out to write you a letter, especially when we know today we can easily send an email or a text and get the same message across. I think we saw some unique or kind of more creative forms of communicating like that in the the early days, if you will, of the pandemic when people were really, um, you know, isolated from the shutdown and trying to find ways to connect. Um, sadly, I don't think that we see those Things still occurring quite as much now that the pandemic has persisted, um, but I think that there's some novelty to that that I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset if that stuck around. Now I found an article on the website WebMD. This is usually where you go when you want to know how to you know, <laughs> take care of some little health problem. But it uh, it had an article on on health and dating and the importance of uh, social relationships to our physical and emotional health. Um, is this part of, uh, do we, I mean, you're both studying subjects that might touch upon this. Is there anything you would like to say about this? The importance of, of maintaining a social life, even when we're, our travel and our social interactions are restricted. 
Yeah, we are social creatures. We have an innate desire to connect with others. And so social relationships are absolutely important for our health um, in a variety of different ways. One of my um, colleagues at the University of Iowa, Dr. Jacob Priest, he studies how relationships impact things like physical health. And he has a, a catchy wow. little metaphor that he uses that I love that talks about how relationships get under our skin because they do. We see physiological differences in people who have supportive, important relationships, people who feel like they have people that they can turn to and talk to, a good source of social support. They tend to have better overall mental health. They tend to have better physical health. They tend to live longer. And so um, social relationships are, are critical for our well-being. Now, Kayla, have you seen some of your classmates that take take positive steps to increase their health. That is, so I'm, I'm gonna editorialize here a little bit. I think one way to respond to this pandemic is to try to shut ourselves out and hope that we can prevent the virus from getting to us. Uh, another complementary way to respond is to take better care of our health, to make ourselves stronger so that if we are infected, we'll be better able to cope with the disease, to fight off the disease, to recover fully. Have you seen some of your classmates make a better effort to tend to their health, physical, emotional health, what have you? Oh, definitely. I think the pandemic has given everybody a chance to evaluate what they think of themselves and how they want the world to see them. So a lot of people have had a lot of time to definitely change that routine, change their eating habits, start working out if they wanted to. Um, and I know that that is something that is very beneficial to your mental health as well. So there has been a spike in that I've seen on campus and in my res hall, at least. I see a lot of my residents hanging out, being active with each other um, in the lobby. I've seen yoga happen. I've seen people just having casual conversations. It's kind of amazing to see. Okay. Now, that same WebMD article contained the the following phrase, I'm gonna look at my notes over here and quote. It said, one effect of the pandemic is to quote, slow down the tornado of passion. Boy, this sounds like a Gothic novel from the medical doctor, slow down the tornado of passion. And when I read other articles, I found an, an article in a Catholic magazine and a Jewish online magazine uh, aimed at young adults who are dating. And these articles said one of the positive things that might come out of this experience is a slower courtship, people taking longer to get to know one another, more conversation, um, yeah, building a stronger relationship by going a little bit slower. Any comments on that? I definitely agree that there are some positives or some silver linings that we can see from the pandemic. And I do agree that um, starting a relationship slow, perhaps in a less physical way, can potentially lead to more longer term relationships. A lot of the feelings related to love or passion or uh, chemistry, right? That's a word we use a lot to describe a connection to someone are tied to our hormones. It's a physiological response that makes us feel driven to connect with someone. And so those chemical reactions over time start to fizzle out a little bit. And so if you don't have an emotional foundation or some other reason that connects the two people, then that relationship might end once that connection fizzles out. And so if you're starting a relationship that's built on connection, it's built on emotional intimacy, then you can really start from the ground up. And then hopefully you have that physical connection as well, but you have a stronger foundation to, to build that relationship on. Now, I've, I've read some criticism or some analysis that suggests dating is a 20th century idea and it's outdated now. And the argument is before the invention of automobiles and adults going away from their parents' home, there really was no such thing as dating. We just met in, the, in mom and dad's parlor in the front of the house in a supervised visit with our, our beau and that was it. And nowadays with people having stayed in school longer and so on, the date comes last, not first, right? So I, I meet a, I met my wife at work, we're rubbing shoulders every day. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't exactly ask. I don't know if I proposed. Somehow I'm married today. I don't know how it happened, but we, <laughs> we just get friendly. The friendship builds, and then, and then we, we know there's something special there. 
but there has to be that opportunity to mingle and rub shoulders and, uh, and get to know people in a friendly way, even if there isn't a, a formal invitation to a date. And some of those opportunities disappeared, movies, concerts, plays, uh, sitting together in a stadium to watch an athletic contest. What have people missed the most? I don't know, which of those activities do you like the most, uh, Michaela? Um, I'm definitely not a sports person, but I will okay. say going to live theater was something that me and my boyfriend really enjoyed doing. We participated a lot um, and it's kind of unfortunate that we don't get to do that as much anymore, but now that we're coming back out of it, that is something that we've enjoyed getting back into. Does my description of uh, modern courtship uh, resonate with you, uh, Kayla? Does that? Uh... Yeah, it's actually something um, that I, I talk about in some of my my classes, um, how dating today is really something new. And it's um, what we think of as dating that has existed for forever is it, it hasn't. <laughs> it's very different today than it has really been before. And so I think our definition and our understanding of what dating is and the norms around it changes constantly. And so maybe the pandemic is just another impetus for, for change. Yeah. So we're right down to the end of our, our half hour. And I'd like you to say just a few words in parting to our audience. Um, who would like to go first here? You just have a minute or so. I can go first. Michaela, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you again for having me on here. And I couldn't echo what Kayla said more. Um, the foundation of a good relationship is definitely friendship. And I think that will see a lot of people through if you just have that strong base of friendship. Okay. And Kayla? Yeah, I'd also like to say thanks. And one thing that I hope maybe another silver lining that comes out of the pandemic is just everyone's understanding of how important relationships are and it's okay to spend time to work on your relationship and that those um, relationships can and should be a priority. And um, it's okay to seek out help when you need it to either work on your own mental health or to work on relationships. And I encourage everyone to support each other in doing that. And I'll just end by with a personal note here. I grew up in a time of situation comedies on TV that led me to believe that every healthy, happy adolescent had a date every Saturday night. That's not true. And many of us find lots of happiness, even if we don't, we don't have a regular romantic relationship now where we think we're getting a later start than others. There's lots of happiness waiting for all of you out there. So thank you for all joining us on Ethical Perspectives on the News, and we hope you can join us again next time. Um, thank you very much, Kayla and Michaela. And Michaela, I hope to see you more on campus now that I've renewed our connection through this television show, and maybe we'll see you again, Kayla, at the university or get you back on a future show. Thank you all in our audience, and uh, goodbye for today. Thank you.